You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy. <laughs> everybody and welcome to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class. With me, your host, Katie Charlwood, history harlot and reader of books. And before we get into this week's episode even remotely, you all should know that this is not for the faint of heart. Trigger warning, there's a lot of bad stuff going on in this. We've got murder, torture, incest, rape, more murder, And general, just shitty things. Just lots of bad. So, if if you are easily offended uh, or have a very soft stomach, might want to skip this one. Otherwise, hi and welcome! So many things to talk about before we get on to what's happening this week. Oh, that really hurt my throat. And my head. If you have not been keeping up with my socials, uh, that's, oh my god, how pretentious does that sound, doesn't it? If you haven't been keeping up with my socials, uh, I'm, I'm quite unwell. I'm actually currently having a little bit of a different setup to what I normally do for recording, as I am wrapped up in the armchair that I usually read my kids' bedtime stories in, because I'm that parent. <laughs> And now, children, it's time to read Danny, Champion of the World. So yeah, I'm in the armchair in the kids' bedroom with the laptop and the mic and blankets and my son's Grogu cushion to rest my back upon because I'm old and broken. So that's what's happening. But just because I'm in excruciating pain and I feel like my brain is going to slosh out my head any moment and, you know, I still can't eat solid food. But it's fine, because what we have here is we have optimism. And we have nine days from day of release, because this comes out on the 10th of October, the 10th of the 10th. We have nine days to get our votes in. For me. (laughs) For the Listener's Choice and the Irish Podcast Awards. Now, you do not have to be Irish to vote or live in Ireland to vote. You just have to vote. So there's a link here in the description down below. You click on it. You type in who did what now, not who did what, because apparently there's also a podcast called Who Did What, and I feel targeted. So go on, type me in, and then you put in your email address, and then you have to click the response in the email to make sure they're not um like a bunch of people voting over and over again. It was really funny though because um. <laughs> a friend of mine was like, I'm going to look at my old MSN email from the 90s. And I was like, what? <laughs> You've got mail. Oh my goodness. Just like people digging out their old email addresses <laughs> to vote, which is the funniest thing. It was like, my pal's like, I emailed from all my alts. I did it. I, like, I appreciate you. <laughs> I appreciate everyone who votes for me. It's absolutely amazing. Just like, segue, I appreciate everybody who leaves me five star reviews which honestly when I'm feeling this bad it's so nice to like click on and be like Katie tells history in a way that's not shit which is lovely I love to hear it I love to hear (laughs) Um, (laughs) it's like my favorite um, one of my favorite like compliments I ever got on like TikTok was like 
you're like the horrible histories of TikTok. Which, honestly, pretty big compliment, to be honest. And um, other news. I have one more news. One more news. I got two more newses. <laughs> two more news. Um, one is that I am doing my first Dublin gig. It's my only Dublin gig so far. And I think it's going to be the only gig I'm going to get to do this side of Christmas. So October 22nd, so that's a Sunday, at 8pm, I'm going to be supported by the amazing Ali O'Rourke. She is fabulous and this all came about because I insulted her on the streets of Edinburgh. <laughs> but yeah, so that's my opening act. She's amazing. She opened for Jonathan Van Ness. She's just fucking awesome. And so we're going to be, we're going to be, well, she's going to open for me, but I'm doing a live podcast uh, at Hysteria at Shane in Dublin. So tickets, there's not many left as far as I know, but you should just, you should come. It'll be great. We can chat after. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to have any merch at this because like that's a lot to organise in a short space of time. And I'm so sick. I'm so very sick. But yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to have everybody there. And my other news is uh, for my kids, actually. <laughs> um, because um, I've been doing like bits and pieces with the kids after school. Because like, by the time we get home, it's like nearly eight o'clock. So it's it's a long day for them. And um, we've been doing our reading, our English and our Irish. So my little girl, she won... Uh, so she was like the Irish speaker of the week like this week in school and I was like yes baby this practicing's working especially considering like we're the same dialect like unlike our dad who's just I mean one is from awfully so that's already a thing but like even if he could speak Irish like it's the wrong dialect so it's not it's not great it'll be handy for her when she has to do like the, the Irish exam, but not now. And um, my son and I have started making stop motion animations using Star Wars Lego. And I've got him storyboarding out things right now um, to help him with his grip. And he is obsessed with this Death Star. But as far as I can tell, it is out, it's out of commission. It's out of stock. It is out of... Whatever the toy version of Out of Print is, it's that. And that's what that is. So I might have to write a very passionate letter to Lego <laughs> and be like, please, it's the only thing he's asked Santa for. <laughs> ah, but anyway, I'll figure that out. But I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what your jabber jabber, in fact, me. In fact, you, I will. But first, we've got to get our source on. Our sources are An Examination of the Life and Trial of Elzebet Battery by Dr. Uma Sadetsky Cardos. Countess Dracula The Life and Times of the Blood Countess Elizabeth Bathory by Tony Thorne. Elizabeth Bathory, A True Story by Alexandra Bartosowicz. Heroine of Horror The Life and Work of Elizabeth Bathory in Letters, Testimonies, and Fantasy Games by Michael Farron. Infamous Lady The True Story of Countess Elizabeth Bathory by Kimberly Craft. The Guinness Book of Records The Symbolic Construction of the Monstrous The Elizabeth Bathory Story by Laszlo Curti. And of course we have our favourites History.com and Biography.com I use it in comfortably. Good. Then let's begin. So at the end of September, I posted like a little Q&A on my Instagram and on my TikTok, basically going, hey, is there anything you want me to cover like through October, anything spooky or creepy or dark from history? And I think every second person requested Elizabeth Bathory, Elizabeth Bathory, Blood Countess, Female Dracula, like one way or the other, they were referring to Elizabeth Bathory. And uh, my mouth is still swollen, so I'm very sorry that my pronunciation in this is probably going to be worse than normal. 
um, I have, I have been practicing, so you're gonna have to forgive me, my mouth ha still hasn't gone back to where it should be, so I'm probably gonna bugger this up quite a bit, but, uh, as, as many of you know, uh, one, I have a thing about calling people by their actual fucking names, we all know my opinions on Grania O'Malley, we all know what it is, you call her Grace, you're fucking trash, you're trash, you're trash, you're trash, you're trash, your podcast is trash, your book is trash, your gen is trash, I don't give a fuck, it's trash. Um, I actually forgot that I ranted about this in the first time around, which is the second point I'm going to make is, I already did this episode, this is a redux, which I'm quite happy to do because the audio the first time, absolutely shocking. You know how they say like, you know, you always have to start somewhere and uh, I did, so yeah, I love when people come to listen to the podcast because it's great. But don't start at the beginning because the beginning is shit. It's it's so bad. Like the audio was bad, and I was even listening to like my old episode to see like was there something I covered that wasn't in my notes because you know I tangent, and I was like, oh no, I didn't even finish the sentence. <laughs> like I would be saying something and then jump off into another one. And yeah, loads of people requested that I talk about Elizabeth Bathory, Elizabeth, and I have already done that. But I have also told people not to listen to my old shit. So that's on me. So I kind of have to do a redux of like the old stuff. And I, I wanted to give people new things, but uh, y'all wanted this. So we're going to talk about Elizabeth. Bathory, the most prolific female serial killer, as the legend suggests. That being said, you know if I'm talking about it, that things generally are not quite as they seem. And now we have gone into the soft voice. Do you like that? The soft voice. <laughs> this is easier for me right now. I must try not to cough. It's difficult but we're gonna get through. You may know her as Elizabeth Bathory, the Blood Countess. Who in the Guinness Book of World Records is listed as the most prolific female serial killer? Because not only did she hunt down the peasantry and the nobility alike, she would capture them, torture them, ensanguinate them and use the blood that they drained from their bodies to fill her bath so that she may bathe in it performing her occult rituals and regaining her youth by soaking her skin in the blood of the innocent except one small thing um it's bollocks. It's absolute bullshit. And I am here to share with you why Elizabeth Bathory was not the horror that we have come to know her as. But the true terror lies in the world that surrounded her and what created this legend to begin with. And you know what? I'm going to fucking say it. Elizabeth Bathory was a victim of the patriarchy. So let's crack this case open and let me tell you the true tale of Elizabeth Bathory. Now let's start at the beginning, shall we? And if you have been listening for a long time, you'll know that generally, women from the past, even noble women, we generally don't have um, much information about them, except, you know, that they were born and... They got married to someone, usually. But we actually have a birthday for Elizabeth. We do. She was born on the 7th of August, 1560, in Nirbator in Royal Hungary. And this is on the family estate. And she is born to Baron George the Sixth Bathory of Exed and Baroness Anna Bathory. So... They're both Bathory's. Now, remember this whole thing about royalty? 
and nobility, like family trees, being a wreath. Now this just keeps repeating. It's just history repeating. So yeah, her her family are noble up the wazoo. Like, there are so many of them. So, like, Elizabeth, her uncle, is the King of Poland, the Grand Duke of Lithuania, and the Prince of Transylvania. Like I said, they're not just noble, they're noble noble. And I think at some point her older brother Istvan was the judge royal of the Kingdom of Hungary for like nearly 20 years or so. And one more thing really about the Batheries in general is that they're Calvinist Protestants. Now, in this kind of area in Europe, you know, you're generally, you know, Catholic or you're like Orthodox Christian. You know, there's not a lot of just, you know, Protestantism like down this vein, but they were. And uh, yeah, that, that probably wasn't the best considering the area they're from kind of ended up well oh how to put this weird but anyway back to Elizabeth so her childhood now again surprisingly I don't know much about that because women in the past not really a lot there back to Elizabeth though now we don't know a lot about her childhood again being a female in the past kind of has its own issues but also not the best documented yeah yeah so we do know a couple things about her childhood we know that she was raised calvinist we know that she was well educated and that she had a falling sickness so we're going to take this in turns i already mentioned the whole religion thing you know religion is kind of an issue in general, in history, and even now, right now, in the world. Because we can't just get over it. Nope. But yeah, she also has this very typical like European education. So you'd see this a lot with even like Catherine of Aragon in Spain and Henry VIII. They were given this sort of humanist, very very well-rounded education like the men and the women the boys and the girls I should say they were all like trained well because you didn't want a stupid kid you didn't want things to get messed up for you when you were doing alliances and whatnot so yeah you didn't you didn't want that but like if you're entertaining dignitaries and people from other countries you do not want to embarrass yourself And you certainly don't want your children to embarrass you. So yeah, through her schooling, um, Elizabeth learns Latin, Hungarian, German, Greek. And that's just the languages. She's a filthy wee polyglot. But yeah, she also learns um, arithmetic. So she learns math, which is good. Because everybody should have like a basic understanding of math. Just even girl math at this point. Um... Just a bit of it. So yeah, she's well educated. She has to be. She's a high-ranking noblewoman in a very tumultuous kind of zone. And yeah, she's, she has, they call it falling sickness, right? And modern physicians, some agree, some don't. Because, you know, when you're getting descriptions of things from the past... Some things are phrased odd or whatever. Um, But the general prevailing theory is she had a form of epilepsy. Because they they describe what seems to be seizures, right? So yeah, the prevailing theory is that it's some form of epilepsy. And fun fact, a treatment at the time during this medieval era for epilepsy was to take the blood of someone who, you know, did not have epilepsy 
and you would rub that blood onto the lips of someone who did have epilepsy because it was supposed to, um, I don't know, cure or the falling sickness, pass on good non-epileptic germs. I, I, I don't know. I d I'm not a ye olde time physician. I don't know what they were thinking. But they thought, this should help. Fuck it, why not? I mean, yeah, I, I guess you, you go do the oldie medicine stuff. Wipe some blood on your lips. Like, does it have to be a specific type of blood? Like, whose blood would they be using? Do they have to be her age? Or like the age of the patient? Or could they just be like anybody's blood? Like, what are the rules? And this, if anybody knows this, tweet me, DM me, fill me in on this information. I must know. Anyway, in 1573, when she's 13, she is betrothed to Count Ferenc Nadazde, who is five years older than she is. So the Nadazdes, uh, they are a very wealthy family and they own quite a lot of Hungary, actually. They own quite a lot of Hungary. And the Bathories, they own quite a lot of Transylvania. So they both have a lot of land, a lot of money, and a lot of power. Now, the Bathories, they are actually a higher social rank than the Nadazdes. So her side is much higher up than his. So her social rank is higher than his. Now, they're betrothed, they're engaged, they are to be wed. And although there is this commitment, there is this agreement, because that's what this is. This is a political alliance. It's a financial agreement. This is just, you know, medieval royal marriages. Because, yeah, families marrying into each other, it's all to ensure, like, political stability, social growth, so on and so forth. And so, Elizabeth and Ferenc, they get married two years later. Now, She's young, and this is a thing people forget about the medieval times, is they think that just because, like, royals and nobility, they arranged these marriages young, they didn't necessarily want them out, like, boinking. Like, this wasn't part of the thing. It was more to secure it than it was to start procreating. You know, that wasn't on the cards. Because, you know, generally... They had a basic understanding that 13-year-olds should not be impregnated and give birth because they're still basically children. Okay? It's not a thing. It's not a thing. It's an alliance thing. But anyway, they get married two years later. In 1575. And he's, you know, he wants to give her a good wedding gift because, you know, you have to. And, you know... Does he go for, like, some jewellery? Spaces from across the continents? No. He thinks, you know what girls love? Girls love castles. We do. We fucking love castles. And so, as a wedding gift, he gives her the castle of Chaita. But he doesn't just stop at a bloody castle. Oh, no. He also provides her with, like, a bunch of houses and... 17, 17 villages that were in this sort of area. So he gives her this big chunk of Hungary. Like now it's um like modern day Slovakia. And I think the castle is, uh, it has a different name in Slovakian, which is Chaktice. Which I would apologize for um if I have pronounced that really badly. <laughs> Please forgive me. But yeah, not bad for a wedding gift, I don't think. A couple of villages, you know, who tracks a land, a castle. But yeah, their wedding day is... Wow, it is the highlight of the season. Because, you know, they're really fucking noble. Again, it's, it's a wreath, you know what I mean? And so, it is like such a big deal that they had... Four and a half thousand guests at their wedding. Again, all from like the top nobility. 
the royals and it is just like the tip top of like transylvanian hungarian nobility society royalty it's just the whole shebang you know what i mean it's like the event of the year it's like the thing to go to but yeah remember how i said like she outranked him like socially so because she is like in the higher part of the hierarchy she keeps her name and he just kind of adds her name onto his so like he just kind of claims that but yeah he's he's like a late teenager at this point and not long after they're married for rinse, he gets the fuck out of dodge because he has to go and uh, continue his studies and like he's he's not really around too much which is not unusual for marriages at the time you know she's got her only castle over there in hungary he is you know doing his thing he's away at college it's fine and then he gets a job <laughs> effectively he's like yeah away because yeah when he actually completes his studies he is appointed the chief commander of the hungarian troops for king matthias the second as it turns out for ends here he is an absolute fucking monster on the battlefield like he ends up with the moniker the black knight of hungary which is good you know for hungary because they're all fighting the ottomans and he is just on his way slinging a sword at the ottomans um, maybe not a sword an axe a pike i don't know a pike just does not seem noble enough you know mace maybe mace seems awkward does that not seem like an awkward like tool for battle i feel like a double-bladed axe is just like a very manageable weapon for a strong athletic man of nobility but that's not the point the point is back home elizabeth is uh doing her thing because he's you know away you know living his best life so because he's away doing his fighting this is all part of the par for her so from the age of 15 she's ruling so she's ruling these estates and villages and these huge tracts of land and she's managing all of Ferenc's holdings which as it turns out are really bloody vast because she's managing business affairs and all of these states and like during the long war she's providing medical care she's defending these areas because the area in which um Chaitya is it's very strategic because it's the trade route to Vienna so this is an area which is kind of under attack a lot it's kind of in demand it's a high value area and I feel like I should explain this a little about Hungary in general so well today it's like modern day Slovakia but Transylvania and Hungary kind of in this time period it is it's I mean it's a little bit confusing because it's it's a strange semi-independent kind of state kind of because this sort of chunk of area that the Bathory's own especially I don't know if you know much about complicated European political structures and conflicts but geography as we know it and um, we kind of see it as specific borders of land mass whereas in the medieval period things would change depending on the boundaries should change depending on sort of political allegiances alliances religious areas like they would all come into it so like transylvania itself it is like sometimes part of hungary sometimes part of the holy roman empire remember that whole thing about calvinist protestantism yeah 
yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's also its own little independent, like, thing. And then, of course, you've got Ottomans who are always trying to, like, uh, take control of it. So, yeah, it's kind of a wobbly-wobbly, you know, moving about a bit. The lines are constantly changing. And again, because Elizabeth is sort of connected to this and also her area in Hungary, there's a lot going on there. And parts of it are basically getting raided quite a lot. So she is consistently taking charge. And again, from the age of 15, let's not forget that. She is managing an area, managing the people and protecting it while it is consistently under threat. Especially this very strategic trade route. And the Ottomans, they're coming in and raiding and Chaitya, it's constantly being plundered. And then you've got Sarvar, which is like in worse peril because it is right on the border between Royal Hungary and Ottoman-occupied Hungary. So not only is she having to like manage his estates, like she's officially charged with managing these estates. So she's doing that and she's involved in all of these grandiose, massive matters, she's also intervening in the lives of everyday women. So she is, and so we have these documented events where she is supporting women whose husbands have been kidnapped by Ottomans. She's providing aid. So you've got medical aid, financial aid, food aid, like, she's coming in on all fronts. Because, you know, these women, like, men are, at this point, the main breadwinner, right? Quite literally, for some of them. And they're not there anymore. So they're lacking all of these forms of protection. And that's where Elizabeth steps in. And then we have this incident, which I think is a testament to the type of person Elizabeth is which we'll get back to right after this break. Being a part of a royal family might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else, like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead, and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera. But this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. And we are back. This woman comes to her. And she comes to her on behalf of her daughter. This woman comes pleading to Elizabeth because her daughter has been raped and has been impregnated. And basically, Elizabeth, she steps in and she gives this, this woman, her daughter, she gives the daughter agency and she says, you know what, you're okay. I'm paraphrasing. You're okay. You're not like a fallen woman. This is not your fault. 
and she supports her and she lets her know that she is provided for and cared for like she's not going to be shame walked in the street or thrown out in the gutter like she's okay but yeah this is what Elizabeth Bathory is doing she is managing estates defending castles running hospitals protecting the lives of the innocents you know like all evil blood countesses do my what a vicious bitch she is so throughout this time Elizabeth does see her husband from time to time generally long enough to get her knocked up so they have five kids in total but I think only three survive into adulthood so yeah while she's doing all this other stuff she also has to raise her children now she wouldn't raise them in what we would see as the traditional raising of children because you know there would be like um, teachers and scholars and uh, maids and nursemaids and everything else like master of sword and all that kind of thing there would be people to do this stuff but something Elizabeth would have done being a lady in the nobility especially in Europe in the time because she had a court and members of the court who would send their daughters to her like noble girls and young women so they would send them there to kind of like best way I can describe it is sort of like a finishing school um, but this is again really common within the nobility so you would send your kid off to someone else like the lord or lady of the realm and then they would send their kid somewhere else and you know it, it's kind of a big deal to have someone of great nobility staying with you because you know it really helps your social rank but it also helped build like these political alliances it also meant that if you had someone's kid you know they were less likely to you know attack you and usurp your power and whatnot you know what I mean I mean you hope they wouldn't put their child's life at risk but <laughs> it's practically medieval anyway that's how alliances were made so teenage daughters of noble families would be sent to Elizabeth's court and they would go finish their education and learn courtly manners they would learn to be functioning ladies of noble society you know they would be under the care of Elizabeth who would teach them how to be proper young ladies and a part of this as well is she would make sure that they were protected and they were chaste and so they would be ready for husbands so they could be you know offered offered is a bad way of saying it but technically yes to like decent members of the court because if you were part of Elizabeth's court because she was such a high-ranking noble like your chances of marrying up or at least marrying well, like your chances are much higher there. It's going to raise your eligibility levels to find a high ranking husband, you know? And so at some point during this era, when Ferenc is away fighting some other war, I don't know, he's always fighting wars, there is this epidemic just like sweeping through the nation and this disease has an outbreak at court. Now odds are it's sweating sickness or something to that effect like there's not a lot of information on what it is but I feel like it's so a small group of these girls from the nobility they get sick and they die and Elizabeth she returns the bodies to the family so they can have you know a proper burial you know a Christian burial and so she ensures the bodies are sent back to the families and this is the only documented case we have of young girls women dying at her court and so the families of these girls they very much agreed and believed that the girls passed away from this illness so much so that one mother goes so far as to provide a sworn statement to a notary saying that her daughter died of the sickness 
and that it's not the fault of the Countess and that she did everything in her power to help them. So, this is still while a war is going on, you know, and Elizabeth, she is running the whole shebang and she's running these estates and she's running them so well, in fact, that these estates are incredibly wealthy. She has what I like to call fuck you money. Absolute fuck you money. She has so much money that she is able to loan money to King Matthias for the war effort. And she does this from about 1601. Now, Ferenc, on the other hand, things aren't going great for him. So it's not clear whether he has an accident or an incident of some kind, or he has some sort of debilitating or degrading condition. And because he starts having this excruciating pain in his legs, which he never recovers from. Like, by 1603, he is permanently disabled. He has no use of his legs. And on the 4th of January, 1604, Florence passes away at the age of 48. But knowing that his end was nigh, Florence entrusts his heirs and his widow to Giorgio Thurzo. Which, honestly, uh, may have not been the best idea, because Giorgio, who also happens to be a cousin of Elizabeth, kind of made a whole career of stabbing people in the back, so, again, not the best of choices. So, like, within a relatively short time period, Elizabeth loses not only her husband, but also her brother. Like, they pass away in, like, a pretty close time frame and her oldest son he's only like six years old at this point and so she has to become the regnant I mean she's already ruling anyway like she was already doing it but now she's officially the regnant for her son because he can't rule he can't be regent yet he can't rule in his own stead you know so she's you know doing it for him and you know I don't know how close she was with her brother and I don't know how close she was romantically with Ferenc, but, uh, you know, it's going to be tough to lose two constants in your life, especially in a short time period. Also, in addition, furthermore, it also cuts down two streams of revenue. So she doesn't have income, you know, from Ferenc being the Black Knight of Hungary. And she also doesn't have any income coming from the estate of her brother. Because he had no son to inherit and, you know, patriarchal bullshit. All of his estate goes to, like, some distant cousin instead of, you know, his nephew. Which, on the family tree, definitely seems like a closer branch. And, yeah, so basically, everything that's her husband's is now her son's. Technically. Technically. But yeah, so she's governing in his stead anyway because, yeah, you know, he's six. Probably best not to let a six-year-old rule a state or half a country. I just feel like not the most reasonable of options, to be honest. So yeah, she's a widow and she has fuck you money. And she has huge estate. Again, strategically located, on the way to Vienna, between here and here. Just, like, a really good place to have. And, yeah, everyone thinks, because she's a widow, she's going to be a soft target without a man to protect her. And um, she's like, <laughs> absolutely fucking not. So, in 1606, this count comes in and tries to, like, seize one of her estates. And she's like, fuck this for a game of soldiers. And direct quote, she says, I will not keep silent. I will let no one take my property. I just wanted you to know this. Do not think I shall leave you to enjoy it. You will find a man in me. Basically, what she's saying is, fuck around and find out. I think love the idea of Elizabeth Bathory just doing the equivalent of being just like, Fuck around and find out, bitch. 
oh my god, Elizabeth Bathory and Alice <laughs> of Battenberg, my two favourite ghosts now. These are my ghosts. Oh, I love them so much. But yeah, she's this wealthy, powerful, strong woman in an era where that really wasn't comfortable accepting those features in a woman. And so at the same time as, you know, she's being attacked, she is putting pressure on King Matthias to pay back what some may call substantial debts, considering she's been funding the Crown's wars for, I don't know, a couple of bloody decades. And then at the same time, uh, her nephew, or is it cousin, she has a relative, another relative, who is the Prince of Transylvania, and he is gunning for King Matthias's throne. And, you know, generally, I think his name is Gorgon, or Gorbin. It's a G name. So generally, wouldn't have really been, like, a massive contender, um, except with Elizabeth's power and money behind him, he becomes a force to be reckoned with. Because Elizabeth is a force to be reckoned with. And naturally, she has to be stopped. Now, for about a year, Giorgio Thurzo, who, thanks to letters from his wife who consistently forgot to write in code, that he was spreading rumours around sort of the clergy about Elizabeth. Because who are people going to listen to? They're going to listen to, you know, men of the cloth. So he has them spreading rumours about her, right? And so he shows up on the 29th of December, 1610. And he interrupts the Countess's dinner. He storms in, interrupting her eating. But like, they always say that they stepped in on her and she was torturing a girl, which... You know, she wasn't, she was in the middle of her dinner. <laughs> like, it's, okay, no. Like, but Giorgio wanted to catch her in an unsuspecting moment. Because, you know, he was a cousin and a member of the lower nobility. And luckily enough, the Palatine of Hungary. The Viceroy. Basically, kind of like the Chief Justice. And so... He decided when he took that role, he was going to gun after Elizabeth. Very helpful, in fact, that he had been entrusted with her care. And so in he goes. Because he wants what she has. He wants her money. He wants her land. And he wants her power. So he gets this Palatine gig. And it comes with power and wealth just not as much as she has because he has already started these rumors swirling around for a long time he has been building his quote-unquote body of evidence and by that i mean bunch of hearsay mainly revolving around her doing dodgy shit occult things which if you know anything about this time period people were either talking about the occult or looking into the occult or studying the occult or learning a many occult things in which to avoid the occult. It's it's basically an aerobarus of occultism. It's just a weird fascination, even today. Like, think of how many true crime shows we watch or listen to. But we're not going to go out and commit a crime. At least not a big one. Maybe a small one. Like, breaking one of those weird laws, like, don't walk a duck up the high street at noon. You know, one of them, because that's just funny. Although, what led to that law being written? You know, how much of an issue was a duck in the high street? So Giorgio shows up with uh, his dudes, he's flanked, and is supported for no reason whatsoever, a certainly not a crippling debt, is King Matthias. So he has sent Giorgio in to investigate, and so he rounds up all the servants and separates them from Elizabeth. And she is surrounded by the gentry and the nobility, and she is like, what the actual fuck is going on? You want to help me out a bit here? And so Giorgio spends a year just like collecting witness statements, the majority of which just feels like hearsay, because a lot of it is like, this happened, and I saw this body, 
and there was like totally a body over there and some people are missing all the while she's under house arrest now people are like there's people missing yeah there's been wars constantly for the past couple decades like people are going missing you're being raided like yes of course people are missing that's something that happens in this time period you know slavery isn't new also like people got kidnapped but yeah there there isn't even like a record of missing people and this is a time where people are writing shit down you know but while she is under house arrest anyway as i should say giorgio's wife goes raiding the countess's rooms so she is looking for jewelry and clothes and all of this stuff right so she basically goes in and steals all her nice shit like yeah that that seems appropriate but yeah this year is spent collecting these witness statements and by collecting witness statements i mean horrific torture which as we know generally doesn't hold up in a court of law now but eventually this trial goes ahead i say trial it's not really a trial because Elizabeth isn't allowed to speak she doesn't have any sort of advocate there is not like a counsel it's basically georgia going in and telling the court what he believes to be true and so he gives this fucking laundry list of just absolute gore he's talking about girls between the ages of 10 and 14 being burnt with candles having needles poked into them tongs their feet being burnt with hot irons searing rods this is a particularly graphic one so skip forward about 15 seconds now searing hot rods pushed into the vagina like then she has freezing water torture where they're thrown in and then there's just abusive servants so according to this testimony she kept her servants chained up every night so tightly that their hands turned blue and blood was just spurting out of the wrists right now correct me if i'm wrong but that sounds like a really good way to get stabbed in your sleep or have your morning tea poisoned i'm just saying so yeah there is talks of her beating a servant so loudly that neighboring monks are just like are literally complaining and throwing clay pots at her of course she also strangles a servant to death with a silk scarf a la the turkish way another thing she supposedly did was stitch her victims lips and tongues together and she makes her servants sit and bathe in baths of nettles beating victims to the point where there's so much blood they had to use ash from the fireplaces to clean it up and absorb it all she also smeared girls in honey and left them outside to be devoured by the ants and the bees and the flies she starved them and if they were thirsty she forced them to drink their own urine and what i think is like the weirdest slash creepiest one actually is she killed a bunch of servants and then stuffed them under a bed five of them stuffs them under a bed and then feeds the corpses as if they're still alive then of course we have uh, uh, the iron maiden of course the iron maiden comes into this so she would place victims within the iron maiden a device supposedly provided to her by her deceased husband the black knight of hungary finally we have the bathing in blood now this information is mainly received from four servants who were tortured horrifically they had these four female servants i might add out of 300 people questioned 300 and they had four so they were all elderly elderly servants all old women they were seen as accomplices right 
they had their fingers torn off with iron tongs and once you know they had no fingers their bodies were thrown into large fires and there was supposedly one male accomplice um who because his man was less involved somehow he he had a you know a, a more considerate death which was being beheaded they decapitated him before then throwing him into the fire and a lot of the nobles they just got to go okay so basically no one gets to cross-examine and all of the information is given via fucking torture under duress so let's break this down a little bit shall we so first of all the iron maiden um lots and lots of talk of this iron maiden um except the iron maiden wasn't a real thing just ask any medievalist like anyone they will confirm this for you it's fake it was invented by the victorians because you know victorians ruin everything so it's really weird that this device gets brought up so much because uh I, this is one of the things that i think is just tacked on over time but anyway you know what else Elizabeth is accused of breathing in blood now bathing in the blood of virgins to keep you young and beautiful um n- no no uh bollocks to that because the one thing that always seems to slip the mind of whoever discusses this is that blood coagulates really fucking quickly like you're talking five to eight minutes before it starts getting all like sticky and gloopy so bathing in it wouldn't really work it's sticky it's not as it looks in the movies like oh it's a thing of blood you need water and stuff to it but if she's wanting this for i don't know occult reasons she's gonna want this pure so on top of this like being the type of nobility she was bathing that much not really not really a huge deal that's why they have their chemises you know so they don't have to bathe so much so yeah also also she's supposed to have personally tortured all of these young girls but here's the thing the blood countess is a bloody countess right she wouldn't actually torture people you know she's too high up she wouldn't get her hands dirty if you're noble you have other people to do that for you so even if she was torturing people mm, which is eh, she would have her servants do her for her like she would have a jailer or you know someone in charge of that that would be their specific duty and here, here's the thing as well this is no different to what men of the same power would be doing in that era if there's a reason to torture somebody again not condoning it but if there was you know they would have someone else do it because it's below their pay grade you know and weird that nobody brings it up so much when men do it but because this is a woman it's somehow worse so on top of this on top of all of this this is a time period where people are writing shit down and she is supposedly what murdered what 600 girls yeah there's not one letter of complaint like if there were complaints and there were complaints they're written down like this is a time period where if somebody was injured or harm or you take somebody's goose or chicken you know there would be a complaint there would be a lodgement it would be written somewhere someone would have gone to a notary somebody would have gone to the somebody higher up they would have bypassed her right and the reason they say it's like 600 girls is because of this supposed book now this is like hearsay upon hearsay because it's basically the servant coming forward this witness and being like i heard this other servant say they saw this book with had like 650 names of all the girls that the countess killed uh yeah yeah except 
no one claims to have seen the book themselves. No one can provide any evidence of this book. And on top of that, nobody mentioned the book until this chick comes in. And this is going to shock you all. But at not one point during the entire year he's doing this investigation. Does he find this fucking book? So yeah, we have no book with this list of supposed names and there are no official records of these supposed missing girls. So like, wouldn't you want to get the testimony of the nobles whose daughters are missing? Because remember, she killed everybody. She wasn't discriminatory in her murderous ways, allegedly. So where were they? Like, this is a time where betrothals were happening, you know? Where did these girls go? Where is the sort of notification of this dissolving and this dissolving and this fella marrying someone else? Where's the information? Where are the reports of these missing girls? Like, peasants, eh, you know, you can understand somebody not mentioning that. But fucking nobility? They're gonna go to somebody after, like, the third girl goes missing. Like, don't you think they would have made a bigger deal? Like, there's this sort of account that the nobles went, well, like, 30 girls over the course of, like, 20 years went missing. Yeah, fair enough. Because... This is a time before penicillin in the Western world. You know, like, people died. (laughs) Infections, you get an infection, you're fucked. Like, you know what I mean? So this nettle situation, so the thing about the nettles and the needles and stuff like that, a lot of that actually aligns with folk medicine, like contemporary folk medicine of this era. So, again, it is like this information's been pulled and twisted. And these numbers throughout the trial, they jump. It's like 400 here, 650 there, 30 there. Like, it just depends and it just moves around. And, again, we don't have any names. We don't have one name of one girl she supposedly killed. Not one. And this is gentry. Even if they are the lower gentry, like, we should have at least one name. So back to Giorgio and his evidence collecting. Even though he apparently showed up while she was in the midst of torturing someone, it still took him 24 hours to actually find any evidence and bring it forward. Like, what's weird is that over the course of this year, no body is found. Not one body. Like, if you've killed 650 people, you know, you're gonna find graves, mass graves. Because, you know, if you're gonna dig a pit, you're gonna dig a big pit, you know? Lest we forget, incinerating bodies, it's tough. You have to get the fire to, like, a certain point. And if she's burning as many bodies as she's trying to, that's that's not going to work. Like, she's not going to get to that point. Like, that's a lot of work. Did she even have enough servants for that? Like, that's... Yeah. You know, in these graves, like, you would find mass graves. If Giorgio Thurzo did find these bodies, they would need to be provided to the relatives because this is an era where everyone's really fucking religious. So they would need to be interred in hallowed ground. But again... No fucking record of that either. So this trial is basically a big show. Because it's not like an official trial. And although King Matthias is like behind it, sort of. Because, you know, if she ends up being, you know, guilty, then he can basically write off his debt to her. But the thing is as well, because of the pressure Matthias is getting, he ends up asking for an official trial for three years. And for three years, nothing happens. Luckily, Elizabeth is smart enough to write to the nobility, to write to her family, and to get all of her ducks in a row. 
she ends up dividing her estates and her wealth, you know, all about to her family to ensure that they are protected. Everything was divvied out because they didn't want a revolt from the Batheries especially because they couldn't quite prove Elizabeth was guilty and they couldn't execute her because that would have been a whole fucking opera and would have caused a war. So they just put her under house arrest. That being said, Georgie is still trying to send her to like a nunnery because he just wants her out of the way. He doesn't want her around. But yeah, she's been working to get everything sorted, the estates, her inheritance, possessions, all going to where they need to go. And so by January 1611, Elizabeth officially is put under house arrest. Now, Georgie, he writes that Elizabeth is bricked up in her room, but with like a little hole at the bottom to like put stuff through. Like, like a little hole for food. Doesn't seem that fun. Does seem like a little bit of a prison cell. Now, he writes that that's what happened. But there are these other accounts that suggest that she literally just is under house arrest. And she's able to walk around, but she's effectively guarded. She has like... Like like a bodyguard, except they're in charge of keeping her in the castle, you know. And probably not the worst instance she could have. I mean, probably for someone who's used to having their own agency and independence. Not super fun. But yeah, she's just kicking about her house. Well, her castle. So not, again, not the worst instance. Now, on the 20th of August, 1614, she complains to said bodyguard that her hands are cold. And he's like, go lie down, you're fine. And so she goes, she lies down, and when they go to check on her the very next morning, she's dead. And the Countess Elizabeth Battery passed away in her sleep at the age of 54. Now, Elizabeth... Her body is allowed to be removed and interred with her family crypt. Which is interesting because for someone who was apparently such a cruel and horrific monster who did all of these awful, terrible things, her body was allowed to be interred on hallowed ground. Which generally shouldn't have been allowed if she was, you know, the demonic wench they claimed she was. Then over the years, through time and history, Elizabeth Battery's story just weaves its way, grabbing bits of folklore and horror as it goes. Whispers here, a little embellishment there, until she becomes known as the horrific Blood Countess, perpetuated by patriarchal standards and abuse throughout the fucking centuries. Because, of course, being an independent strong woman at any point in history means that your reputation will not be accepted or protected by the pale and stale male historians. And so the reputation or personhood, or any person who does not fall into the neat little box of womanhood, has to be tarnished, twisted, or destroyed. And so ends the story of Bathory Elizabeth de Itchid. And what did we learn today? The fact that a level-headed wife and mother was also a competent manager of massive wealthy estates continued to be a powerful public figure instead of retiring in mourning after her husband's untimely demise was the downfall of this intelligent, strong wild woman in 17th century Hungary. And also, in addition... Furthermore, we are yet again reminded that the easiest thing to gain and the hardest thing to lose is a reputation. Elizabeth Bathory was framed. So, there we go. That is today's episode. Don't forget you can follow me on all of the socials. I'm on Twitter or X or whatever it's called now. 
Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Um, I do have a website. I promise to update it soon. It's getting there. Remember, if you want to come see me at my show, that's two weeks time-ish. Under two weeks time. I should probably write that out. I feel like that's a good idea. Let's do that. And of course, vote for me and the listener's choice. <laughs> um, before I leave as well, I am going to give you some recommendations for watching. You'll need to go watch Practical Magic. It's a palate cleanser. It really is. For listening, I'm going to go with the Buried Bones podcast. And for reading, let's head a classic with Bram Stoker's Dracula. Now that we have our options, I am going to wish you good night. Adios, au revoir, au revoir, my friends. Bye bye.